Okay, all set now. Thank you. As chair of the House Ways and Means Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with House Rule 67 and the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to Executive Order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. This is a work session on, on Senate bills. Please note there is no physical location for members. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Okay, I'll continue. Please note that there is no physical location for members of the public to observe and listen contemporaneously to this. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through the Zoom electronic meeting platform and the public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by the Zoom platform or by telephone. All necessary access information has been made available on the House calendar and through the electronic calendar on the general court website. The notice for this meeting complies with House rules and RSA 91A. Anyone who has a problem accessing the meeting should call 271-3600 or email hcs at leg.state.nh.us. In the event the public is unable to access this meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. I want to introduce the staff that are on the meeting assisting us, which is, which is Christine, Christina Dyer. Uh, Who's the committee researcher? Please note that all votes that are taken during this meeting shall be done by roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states they're present, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. Okay, Representative Bernstein, would you call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning to you. It is May the 4th, 2021. It's 9.33 a.m. We'll begin roll call with Representative Patrick Abrami. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm here in Stratum. Uh, uh, I'm my home in Stratum uh, alone. Thank you. Representative Mary Griffin. Representative Jordan Owery. And may the 4th be with you. <laughs> I bet you can hear me. I'm home alone or at home. The wife is in the house someplace. Thank you. Good morning. Representative Ober. Here in Hudson with the six cats. And for the chairman, I have a dentist appointment at 12. I'll be leaving a little early. Noted. Representative Doucette. Good morning, Mr. Clerk. Home alone, my uh, office in Salem. Good morning. Uh, your clerk is Alan Burstein. I'm in Nottingham, New Hampshire, in my home office by myself. Representative Elliott. I'm here in Salem, New Hampshire, at my daughter's Ooh. house. Um, and I can't wait for my wife to come home. Very good. Representative Janigian. Home in my uh, home office in Salem, and my wife is somewhere in the house. Back on the mainland, Representative Herschel Nunez. Good morning, Mr. Clerk. Thank you very much. It's good to be back. Uh, I am home alone in Pelham. Representative Tim Baxter. Representative Spilsbury. Good morning, home alone in Charlestown. Good morning, Representative Tudor. Good morning, home alone in Northwood. Representative Almy. Morning, uh, home alone in Lebanon. Good morning, Representative Ames. <clears throat> I'm here in Jaffrey in my home office alone. Representative Southworth. Home in Dover alone. Representative Malloy. Alone, Greenland, um, in my home. Representative Thomas Schamberg. Good morning, Representative Burstein. I'm in New London, be getting in my truck very shortly, heading back to Wilmer. Representative Tucker. I'm home alone in uh, Randolph. Did you have to check your notes for that? I'm just making sure I wasn't muted. <laughs> <laughs> Representative Gomarlo. Uh, I'm in Swansea alone. Representative Lofman. Representative Gorg. 
Representative Hacken Phillips. Morning. I am alone here in my office in Concord. Representative Murphy. Uh, good morning. I am alone in my home office in Hanover. Good morning. And our chairman, Representative Norman Major. Good morning. I'm in my home in Plasto and my wife is in the house. Mr. Chair, there are 20 members present, four are not present. Thank you, Representative Bernstein. This morning we have a work session on seven bills that we have heard. And I'm going to have to leave by 11 o'clock and Representative Romney will take over at that point in time. We'll start off with Senate Bill 22-FN. Senate Bill 22-FN is relative to the sale of Lucky 7 tickets. And these work sessions this morning is to identify, do we have any, any further questions or more information that we need on any one of these Senate bills? Now is the time to bring that out and so that we'll have the time to, if, if we need to, uh, bring somebody else in to answer questions. So does anybody have any issues or questions on Senate Bill 22 or additional information they need in order to make a determination. We will not be executing today. We will be executing these bills next Tuesday. Any questions? Norm? Yes. Um, I got a call from uh, Tyler Clark um, about section three. Um, he, he thinks we need to change the wording a little bit. Um, if Tyler is on the call, if he's on the Zoom, I'd, I'd like him to explain it. Would, I, he was going to send me some language, but I haven't seen it. Uh, Jen, is he? Tyler is he, Clark, is, would you let him in? I just did. He'll be here in a second. Okay. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Tyler. You yes, ready? just to... Yes, I can hear you guys. Uh, just to address Representative Abrami's uh, concern here, I happened to send it to your legislative email, but I know there's a lot going on, so it might have gotten lost in the kerfuffle. But Section 3, uh, as I read it right now, it does mandate that a charity has to purchase a 25-cent ticket where a $1 ticket is sold. Um, you know, as I told Representative Abrami, the 25 cent ticket, at least for our business, diamond distributors, and we uh, sell paper lucky seven tickets to bingos in charities. Uh, that's one of our least selling products. So we find it kind of unfair to mandate that they have to purchase a, a product that, you know, we don't sell a lot of, and they probably don't have many consumers who or players who purchase these uh, tickets. Uh, there is a small market for 25 cent tickets, but we don't believe that it should be mandated. So I have some language that just states, you know, the price of a ticket shall not exceed a dollar. And then it strikes the language stating that it, they must, shall sell a 25 cent ticket where a dollar ticket is sold. And I know that language of uh, mandating that a, where a dollar ticket is sold, a 50 cent ticket must also be sold as part of the uh, compromise from last year's legislation that created the dollar ticket. So I did not touch that language. I simply, uh, in the language that I proposed, or will I'll send it to the committee, just struck the, the section that said we shall sell a 25 cent ticket. Questions from the committee, uh, Representative Alamy. You're muted. Susan, you're muted. Sorry, I think that the phone in attendees is Mary Griffin, and I ask that she be allowed to participate, if so. Uh, but also on, I wanted to to contest the the 
the other parts of the bill. And I don't know, does that mean on just bringing in an amendment to, I think it's delete both of them. I thought we were gonna discuss all this stuff again, um, but they do uh, complete turning these machines into uh, semi-slot machines and allow them on in another bill to go into just about every place in New Hampshire that might possibly be able to take them. Uh, and and I, I know this may be a losing argument at this point, but on uh, turning ourselves into Oregon doesn't seem like a great idea. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Bromney. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'll, I'll, let me take a look at the language that uh, Tyler is talking about. And then uh, I may just do up an amendment, but if, uh, Susan, if you, uh, Representative Ami, if you wanna do an amendment, uh, I'll, I'll share this with you and you may also wanna incorporate it into your amendment. Yes, yes, I would like to incorporate the 25 cent part. Yep. And I think Representative Griffin is in favor of that too, but if that is her, I think it would be nice if she could be brought in. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I allowed that person to speak. So if it is Mary, maybe she can. Um... Okay, the, the one with the phone ending 089. Yes. Could identify yourself? Star six, I believe. Christina, correct me if I'm wrong about that. Star six to talk. I believe that's correct. Um, my understanding is that um, Representative Griffin's ends in zero, um, six, uh, five, nine, nine, five, nine, is what nine, I believe five, it is. Nine. Yes, right. I don't think it's her. Oh, Mr. Chair, I think Mr. Christina's she on. Said she'd come. Mr. Chair, Christina's on for another, a, a different bill, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, okay, so we didn't find the identity of that 089. No, no. And again, Representative Almy, what was, what was your position on the 25 cent ticket? Um, I'm, I'm in favor of making it optional. I realize I mean, 25 cents was more money when it was put in than it is now. <laughs> it's kind of like having the penny ante bingo that, that I know about. Right, and, and the bill as written right now, it says the organization shall offer 25 and 50 cent tickets for sale. And so, and so you agree with the amendment. I agree with that amendment. I just don't like sections one and two. Okay. All right. Uh, What's my name? Uh, thank you. <coughs> um, so I think uh, Mr. Clark is still um, available to answer questions. Mr. Clark? Yes, I'm still here, Representative Ames okay, and Chairman Major. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, my understanding is that you oppose the bill and um, that that relates to the provision that makes the uh, availability of paper tickets, is that the right word, for paper results uh, um, optional? Is that correct? Correct. Uh, Diamond Distributors opposes section one and two of the bill. Okay. Uh, so on that uh, op option, I'm, I'm wondering if you have information or your perspective on what uh, eliminating that, uh, that paper requirement uh, does in terms of the speed of betting that's enabled by the machine. How frequently can bets be made with or without the paper option? I don't have any updated information as to how fast the ticket prints, but I do know that through rulemaking last summer, 
uh, the speed of play on these machines was increased. So it was previously five seconds a spin. And now it is, uh, I think it was moved to two and a half, but realistically it's at three is, is my understanding of how fast these machines play. So it's every three seconds. And I think the printing may be able to keep up with that, but there could be somebody else here who is more uh, in tune with how these machines function these days that could probably answer that. But my understanding is they're set at three seconds now where they have they're, through rules, they can be set at three seconds. Okay, well, thank you. That's very, very helpful to have that three seconds in the record. I'm glad to know that. Uh, do we have anybody from the lottery? Uh, is John Conforti one of the lottery people? Yes. I can let him in. I have he raised his hand. Okay. okay. Oh, Christina did. Christina's our um, our Jennifer for today. Oh, I'm sorry. Did, I confused it with somebody else that's going to be speaking later. Okay, sorry. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. John Conforti, uh, Chief Compliance Officer for the New Hampshire Lottery. I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Do you have any information on how fast speed of play could be for machines that would be dispensing? My, my understanding is that the um, the timing, as as was indicated, is set by rules, and that the um, the printing mechanism is not going to be uh, a determining factor in how fast the the, the gameplay uh, would be allowed. Now, is there anything that is in rules now, or have they thought of anything, uh, the timing that they would incorporate if this passes? Uh, Representative Major, I don't believe that we've had any discussions about um, how we would um, address any of these changes in rules other than um, obviously making sure that the rules conform to the to the change regarding deal size um, and um, you know that the payment would be based on the 3500 tickets as opposed to the um, uh, as opposed to one deal um, but I don't believe that we are anticipating um, other rule changes other than, um, specifically aligning the rules with the new statutory language. Right. And there's no statutory language that suggests how, much, how speedy these could be. I don't believe that the timing of the machines is addressed in statute. Okay. Any further questions, Representative Almy, followed by Representative Ames? Oh, no, I'm not on anymore. Sorry. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, these machines were approved reluctantly by our committee as dispensing machines. On, during the hearing, on, Charlie told us that uh, they don't dispense. They have been converted uh, because we didn't nail down every little piece of the language of how these machines work, uh, they have been converted into uh, video lottery machines, essentially, on, by putting out on the, the result on the monitor, making it unnecessary to have look at a ticket so you can do it a lot faster. When, you, when it was a dispensing machine, which is what we thought we were approving, on the ticket drop down, you had to pick up the ticket and look at it. So there was considerably more time involved. Now that they've eliminated that by allowing it to be on the monitor, on the the debate that we're having essentially is whether we are going to just sanction in law what has already been done by the Lottery Commission. 
And I just want to object. Thank you. Representative Elliott, followed by Representative Doucette and Abramney. Uh, Representative Elliott, you're muted. I have a question for Mr. Clark. Uh, is it my understanding that you were opposed to the 25 cent and the 50 cent uh, ticket? Um, because, and I asked that question because in most of the casinos that I've been to um, even have penny machines. So my understanding or opinion is that this is for the poor people who like to gamble. Uh, so I, I don't understand why you want to eliminate uh, the 25 cent or 50 cent ticket or am I misunderstanding you, sir? Thank you for the question, Representative Elliott. Um, just to clarify, there might be a slight misunderstanding. Uh, we do not oppose a 50 cent or uh, the dollar ticket at this point in time. And, you know, we absolutely support bringing back the 25 cent ticket. Uh, we think it was uh, a uh, oversight last year, you know, when the language was drafted for the dollar ticket um, that we accidentally removed the 25 cent ticket. And I you know, we, we do sell or we did sell 25 cent tickets, just not many of them. Uh, we don't sell any dollar tickets. Uh, we sell all 50 cent tickets to bingos and fraternal organizations so that they can sell them uh, at their bingo or at, in their fraternal hall. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, when I look at the screen, it's different than the participants. So I'm going to use the participant list uh, the next one is Fred Desat, Representative Desat. Good morning. Uh, just informational for you, Mr. Chairman. I was on the phone with Representative Griffin, and, and uh, she is unable to attend today. I just wanted to confirm that to you, and I told her I would. Thank you, Representative Desat. Representative Bromley. Yes, uh, just, just a point of, uh, of information for the committee. The, there are such there is such a thing as dispensing machines as well that dispense the old-fashioned uh, uh, tickets. A lot of fraternal halls have those because they don't want somebody walking around selling the tickets, so they just go to the machine and they can dispense as many of the of the, the true the old-fashioned lucky seven pull tabs as they want. So those still exist. And uh, Representative Ami is talking about the the electronic version of that. The electronic. Uh, uh, version of uh, Lucky Seven. Thank you. Uh, uh, Representative Tucker. Yes, I would very much like uh, to know what Representative Griffin thinks of this, since we wanted to get information today as to different opinions. And perhaps someone could be delegated to talk with her and uh, find out her opinion before it comes up again. So we're ready to understand. She's sort of the expert. I have uh, been impressed with her ability to uh, be persuasive too. And, and to protect her seniors. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but uh, I think this is very important. I think that uh, Representative Almy has brought up some concerning uh, points and uh, I'm now conflicted as to how I uh, understand this, these issues. And it's getting murkier by the minute. And so uh, I'd like our expert to speak up. Fred, Fred can you check with uh, Representative Griffin? I will do so. Uh, again, Mr. Chair, like she said, she's unavailable to uh, speak to the group today and um, well, I'll, have reach out, I'll have a reach out to you directly, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Alamy. Thank you. Uh, I called her up last night because I wanted to know what she thought of these things. I discovered she has not seen any of these bills. They are not sending them to her and obviously she can't get them herself. On um, so I tried to read her two of them 
And um, that is obviously very difficult for someone who is 96 years old. Uh, she did say that on that she disagreed, that she agreed with uh, Mr. Clark's idea on the 25 cent ticket on, but that she didn't want to see her low income seniors on lose all of their money in, in machine gaming. And she didn't put it quite that way, but, but that she was worried about these machines going to the electronic side. And I, I wish she'd be able to, uh, she did last night tell me that she was going to be on today. So. Mr. Chairman. Yes, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put words in, in the representative's mouth. I spoke to her not five minutes ago, and she didn't make a definitive uh, decision as to where she stands on this. And like I said, um, short of her speaking directly to you or to this committee, um, I would caution others to do the same thing. So uh, yes. I, I, will, I will call her right now and have her uh, get a hold of you, Mr. Chan, but she's, uh, she's not well this morning. Well, maybe we that would be very good because I was just trying to say that so that you could see that there was a debate in her mind at this point, at least. Listen, uh, this is going to be f further discussed next Tuesday, and uh, we'll give Representative Griffin some, some time and we'll check with her. Is there anything else new on Senate Bill 22? Then, Mr. Chairman, um, John Conforti seems to have his hand up. Who? From the lottery. John, go ahead. Thank you, Representative Major. I just uh, wanted to make a quick point of clarification um, that to, to, to add to your discussion. Um, the electronic Lucky 7 machines do dispense tickets currently. Um, I, I don't know. I know Representative Almi indicated that um, um, Director McIntyre uh, said that they, they don't. I think as a practical matter, players view the results on the video screen currently. Um, but I do want just for a point of clarification as you're, as you're looking at this bill, I, each of those machines does dispense a paper ticket. Um, it's just that as a practical matter that the players tend to ignore those tickets as they're dispensed. Thank you, John. That's good information. Okay, for, for those that have an amendment, please get that amendment out this week to all the committee members so they have it to go over when we meet next Tuesday. I, I would like to get this exact next Tuesday. Okay. Could we Mr. Chairman? Yes. Could I just ask uh, Lottery to do one thing, which is to find us whether there is anything in the RSAs that allowed them to start showing the result on the video monitor or whether we're just putting it in post facto. Thank you. Uh, did you get that? Yes, I did. I we will um, send a response to Representative Almi and, and the uh, rest of the um, committee. Thank you. All right. Next Senate bill is Senate Bill Twenty Seven, relative to the sale of Lucky Seven tickets again. And again, we don't have anybody signed up uh, to add any further information. So I asked the committee members what questions remain to be answered or additional information that you have. I know that uh, an amendment has been brought forth by Representative Almy. So why don't I'm uh, Representative Bromley? I'm sorry about that. So what, why don't you represent Bromley? explain what your proposed amendment is. 
Okay, uh, Charlie McIntyre. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Charlie McIntyre asked me to uh, file this amendment. Uh, he feels that there occasionally will be an exception to the rule as to what constitutes a charity that's eligible. Uh, and the, the, I think this got sent to everybody. Uh, and uh, I, I, I'd like uh, Mr. Conforti to speak to it, but also- um, Okay, the amendment is amendment number 2021-1236H. Right. And then there's also a Lisa Allen, uh, who's is an example of an organization that would benefit from this amendment. So if, if John is uh, uh, still, yeah, John is still on, uh, maybe he can explain uh, the reason for the, the amendment. John? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative Abrami. Yes, um, we had requested uh, that Representative Abrami uh, make this amendment. Um, there are um, isolated incidents where we have charities um, that are uh, bona fide charities doing uh, work in uh, New Hampshire um, that would um, that meet the the spirit. Um, and purpose of the statute, but do not check all the boxes um, with regard to um, rep um, either being registered with the Secretary of State as a nonprofit or with the Attorney General's office um, for one reason or another. Um, I believe that Feed New Hampshire is uh, on and can address their specific um, circumstances um, uh, more directly, but uh, there are there are circumstances where um, for example, a charity is an arm of a for-profit company and through oversight, um, it hasn't been separated into a separate nonprofit, um, or it hasn't registered in time. Um, and certainly, um, what we have found is there are worthy charities, um, who meet the requirements, um, of doing nonprofit work, doing charitable work in the state. They are not fly by night operations. They are well established, um, but their filing has not uh, been at the Secretary of State's for the required amount of time. Um, or there is some other very minor technical defect which prevents them from being licensed as a charitable, uh, as a charity for gaming purposes. Um, so the intent of this amendment was to provide a mechanism for those very few circumstances um, where an organization can demonstrate that they are a, an established charity doing charitable work here in New Hampshire, um, that the funds from charitable gaming would remain within the state um, and that there was a, there's a justifiable reason why they're not able to meet one of the technical requirements of the statute. Um, we, these are so infrequent that we didn't feel that a change of the um, definitional requirements was appropriate, but that there should be some mechanism um, to allow for these, these one-offs um, uh, to, to participate in charitable gambling. And John, you must... There was a charity might be here. Did you identify who that might be? Yes, I believe there's a representative from uh, Feed New Hampshire um, who um, has we've worked with um, and is a great example of um, of this circumstance. Uh, Mr. Chair, it's uh, Mr. Chair, it's Lisa Allen. Is her name? It's who? Lisa Allen. And I see her down the bottom of the screen that she's, she's, I think she's already in. Yes, she has permission to talk. Okay, fine. So uh, well, before we go to Susan, I mean, to represent Elmi, go ahead, Lisa. Hello, um, my name is Lisa Allen. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and all, and thank you for taking the time to hear, to hear us today. I'm the board chair for Great New Hampshire Restaurants Char Charitable Trust, which we um, lovingly call feednh.org. We are registered with the Director of Charitable Trust in New Hampshire, and we file an annual report with this office, and we are also a tax-exempt 501c3 with the IRS. In the last six years, we've donated over $700,000 to dozens of New Hampshire charitable organizations, 
serving New Hampshire's families, elderly, education, and disadvantaged. Currently, the way the rule is written, we are not eligible to receive ga charitable gaming donations because although we are registered with a director of charitable trust, we are not registered as a charitable um, organization with the state. Mostly, um, actually all in part, because of the way we are set up. The trust is set up with three trustees and we have a board of nine community members who serve to make decisions about um, how we raise funds as well as how we disperse funds. If we were, feednh.org is a charitable arm of a for-profit company. Um, by registering with the state as a charitable organization, that would force us to have um, basically turn over the control of our trust that we built to serve what our customers, our employees, the families, elderly, education, and disadvantage. Um, and we would have to have five non, at least five board members that would control this um, charitable trust if we were to set it up that way. Um, so really that's it. I mean, this simple language change that just says as long as we're registered with the Director of Charitable Trust in New Hampshire and our filings are up to date um, and we are a 501c3, which we check all of those boxes and we're not required to um, change the way we have set up our trust to serve our communities, um, we would be eligible for this gaming where currently gaming donations where currently we are not. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, questions for Lisa? Uh, Representative Almy, followed by Representative Bromley. Uh, mine is not a question for Lisa. Uh, I, I understand and am okay with the amendment, just not with dependency on gaming. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Bromley. Actually, um, I, my hand was up from before. I'm all set. Okay. Uh, Representative Ames. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I just want to be clear uh, on what this amendment does. Um, and I am handicapped because I don't seem to have the statute in front of me, the existing statute. But uh, but it's reassuring to, to know that your organization is a 501c3 and the problem you're having encountering is uh, the registration requirement with the attorney general's office. There's some variation there. Um, and my question to you is if this amendment goes through, would the requirement that um, the organization, your organization, uh, would still have to demonstrate it, compliance with the federal rules regarding, um, I, don't, I don't quite know how to say this, the charitable organization rules that lead to your citing 501c3 as, a, as, a, uh, as one of the criteria. Um, we are more than happy to and able to um sustain all of our current, uh, I, I'm kind of trying to search for words like you are, but all the filings that we have to do for both with the Charitable Trust um, Division of New Hampshire, as well as the IRS, we are current with that and more than happy to continue being current with that. I'm not sure if that is exactly what you are asking. Um, we, because, because it's an arm of a for-profit business, um, we do put a great deal of effort into the guarding any conflict of interest. So we have separate attorneys for this charitable trust. We have separate accountants for the charitable trust. Um, we, we do all of our diligence to ensure that there's not 
ever any question that the money is being used for anything but what we wanted it to be used for, which is to serve other New Hampshire charitable organizations. We're, we're basically a fundraising um, machine for all these organizations in New Hampshire. And it allows, we had a gaming, a gaming organization reach out to us wanting to donate to us and then sort of hit a brick wall and unable to donate to us because of the way this rule is currently written. Okay, okay thank, thank you. Uh, Follow-up? Well, I guess it's not really a follow-up. I, I think that uh, it would be helpful to have lottery uh, confirm what requirements would, would apply <coughs> if this amendment were adopted. Uh, with specific reference to 501c3 and its uh, and the the group of 501c um, provisions that organizations right now have to um, demonstrate that they meet they comply with. At least, uh, not John. Sure. Thank you for the question, Representative Ames. So our the intent of this um, is um, that th it's a waiver provision and they would the um, anyone who's applying for a waiver um, would need to demonstrate that they are still organized for a charitable purpose. Um, obviously, five, 501c3 designation or any of the other 501c designations would be uh, probably important evidence of that. It's not specifically called out in the amendment. Um, but our expectation would be that we wouldn't grant a waiver, uh, that, that, that anyone who's seeking a waiver is likely to, um, to have those 501c3 um, requirements uh, be complying with those currently and would continue to. Um, again, this is really to address issues where the nature of the charity is such that um, they're, they're not either currently registered with the Secretary of State as a nonprofit um, or cannot as, as Feed New Hampshire as, as indicated. Thank you, John. Are you all set to represent Ames? For the moment, I, I need to look. I, I, as I said, I was handicapped. I don't have the statute right in front of me. I want to look closely at this and if um, and be satisfied that uh, that the allowance for a waiver doesn't reach into provisions that sh should under no circumstances be waived. All right, and we'll be addressing this bill again next uh, Tuesday. All right, we have Representative Elmi, did you raise your hand again? Yes, I did. I'd been I'd planned on speaking when we went off to the amendment. I mean, I'd planned on speaking about something else. <laughs> Two things, actually. Um, both of them require more information, or rather, one of them does. That is, we were going to we asked at the first meeting, I believe, what are all of these C's, 501 C's? We still don't have a list of uh, maybe from charitable trusts, I don't know who would give it to us, of what is comprised by C4, which I know has a lot of political organizations in it, on C8, 7, 8, 10, and 19. And I also would point out this is charitable gaming on expanding it to this extent would make it a lot harder unless we're going to have um, thought parlors like the one that's going to be in Lebanon everywhere in the state, but that would probably help. Uh, it would be considerably harder for any charity to get, get a slot. Um, and my other question, but I would, like to get a list of what kinds of organizations in somewhat more detail than just this is a civic organization um, are in these different categories. And 
The other question is about uh, section five, which was added on is, is just about bingo. And it seems to contradict part of uh, the bill we just discussed. It says that there is a deal means a single game of uncirculated lucky seven tickets bearing a serial number. So I think we need to discuss that too. Thank you. Okay, Representative Tucker, you had your hand up. Uh, I took it down uh, because we seem to have moved on. I see that Representative uh, Hagen Phillips's hand is up. Uh, Representative Hacken Phillips. Good morning. I just was going to follow up on Representative Almy's question about the IRS codes that are listed on page, uh, I guess that's two of the bill or paragraph 15 of the bill. So if I'm looking at the IRC code, um, uh, it's US code, 26 US code 501, uh, section C. And if you look to the definition, sec subsection four are social welfare um, organizations. So um, like she was mentioning, that's a, a pretty wide definition of what that is. Um, but if you look at the code, it, it does narrow it a bit down um, specifically civic leagues or organizations not organized for profit, but operated exclusively for the promotion of social welfare or local associations of employees, the member of which, a membership of which is limited to the employees of a designated person or persons in a particular municipality and the net earnings of which are devoted exclusively to charitable educational or recreational purposes. Um, subsection C7, is uh, clubs organized for pleasure, recreation, and other non-profitable purposes, substantially all of the activities for which are for such purposes and no part of the net earnings of which inures to the benefit of any private shareholder. Subsection C8 are fraternal beneficiary societies, orders, or associations operating either under the lodge system for an exclusive benefit of the members of a fraternity itself under the lodge system or providing for the payment of life, sick, accident, and other benefits to the members of such society, order, or association, or their dependents. Uh, subsection C10 is a domestic fraternal society order or association operating under the lodge system. Um, but it would have either the net earnings of which are devoted exclusively to religious, charitable, scientific, literary, educational, and fraternal purposes. And, uh, or, oh no, I'm sorry, it's, it's, a, it's an and, so it would have to meet both qualifications and which do not provide for payment of life, sick, accident, or other benefits. Um, subsection C19 is, uh, is that page down here? It's a post or organization of past or present members of the armed forces of the United States. So think uh, VFW or an, another auxiliary unit, um, or it's a trust or foundation for any post or such organization. It would have to be organized in the United States and have at least 75% of the members of which are past or present members of the armed forces of the United States and substantially all of the other members of which are individuals who are cadets, spouses, widows, widowers, ancestors, lineal descendants, et cetera, and have no part of the net earnings which inures to the benefit of a private shareholder individual. I think the important thing for the committee to consider is that there are several other subsections of the IRS uh, code 501 subsection C that are not included. And I think this goes back to, you know, previous discussions we've had about, you know, this area of the, the code, you know, there are other organizations that are excluded. So for instance, like teachers unions, cemetery companies, um, trusts, um, there are, um, you know, other 
organizations in the sub chapter who are organized in such a way to benefit those members um, internally. And I'm not sure that it's um, the purpose of providing a charitable, you know, donation or, uh, or fund or contribution to these 501Cs is equal among the subsection 501C subsections. So uh, I just think it's worth considering. Uh, obviously, everyone will have their own opinions about how and which you know organizations are worthy of charitable um, you know donations and contributions. I'm just not sure that they're all equally um, you know benefiting those of the public sector or those of their internal membership. It's just something to consider and weigh. So, Representative, what is your recommendation? Um, I'm not sure that I formulated an opinion, but I do think that the, you know, not each one of these 501c subsections, in my opinion, should be benefiting from a public charitable donation. For instance, um, you know, fraternal lodges who are benefiting themselves for, uh, you know, their own purposes to further their organizations. Um, I'm not sure that we should be allowing them to benefit from public funds to support themselves internally. I mean, I'm not sure that that's the intent of the original bill. If it was going directly to the community broadly, perhaps. Um, it's just something you need to consider. Um, Do you feel that's something that should be uh, melded into the waiver requirement? Well, I think the waiver requirement is actually a pretty strong, um, it's a strong argument for trying to find um, other charitable trusts and other organizations that don't fit that two year period under the Secretary of State filing, or I think it's one year, sorry. Um, it's, it's important that a waiver should be allowed, I think that especially if they're if those organizations have already qualified for a 501c3 um, tax exempt status. Um, but I, I do have concerns about, um, for instance, you know, it is possible to be a 501c3 and have less than 20% of your revenue or your distributions being um, allocated to lobbying efforts, uh, for instance. So that could be a political subsection of that 501c3, um, those activities could be donated towards a specific issue area of a specific policy. And um, although they don't meet the threshold to con be considered a lobbyist, those are, you know, some lobbying activities. So should we be supporting these subsections in those limited but possibly material activities. And I just think it's, you know, we need to be aware that that is a possibility and then make our own decisions of whether or not, um, you know, New Hampshire should be supporting that through legislation. So um, I think the waiver is important because it allows um, pretty distinctively to say, you know, in this amendment that it would have, these funds would have to be, these organizations would be operating here and um, primarily in the state of New Hampshire, and that the revenue raised by the organization participating would be used to benefit the state. So I think that's an important caveat. I wouldn't want to lose that for any waiver, but um, I mean, I guess the question is, if they're applying this revenue towards a lobbying effort to the state of New Hampshire on an issue area that's highly divisive, is that something we want to support? Could you outline a set of tests that, that you feel would um, be very beneficial to the state and allow these charities that would fit the waiver if they pass these tests? I know I looked at the book. <laughs> and it is a book. It's a huge book. It doesn't stop. Uh -huh. uh, if we put a bill in that went through every 501c, uh, we'd have a separate journal. 
just for that. So what we do need is to have something that covers specific cases. Uh, you brought out some good points that they had to be New Hampshire uh, organization, benefit New Hampshire charitable things and that sort of thing. So maybe you could put out some uh, guidelines that could, that you could consider for next week. I will do my best to try to add to that um, discussion, I'm not sure that um, you know that's that's a pretty large <laughs> task you're asking for. Uh, sure I'm I'm sure. Just from just from my you know attorney brain that I occasionally use when I sit in my representative's chair is just it's very difficult to try to prevent you know any loophole around the system. And I, that is our job, is to try to think through these scenarios. Well, um, that's something perfect. We can, we can probably improve the, not only the amendment, but the bill itself, I'm, I'm sure, with a few ideas. Fine, if you could do that, that would really, I think, make more people comfortable about this. Uh, Representative Major, can I uh, just ask Representative Hecken Phillips, Another question about this from the beginning of what she was talking about before we give this one up. Okay, uh, uh, sure. Representative Bromney had, had his hand up. But I know, he's going to a different thing, I think. That's okay, Norma, uh, Representative Almy can go first before me. Representative Almy. Thank you, um, it's about C4s. I know C4s fairly well. All the ones I know are polit for political lobbying purposes and political, no, for political election purposes. Yeah, I think I don't know how they got there from the definition that you, you uh, read us, but that's what they are. I'm sure yeah. the NRA has one, the Family Plan, uh, Planned Parenthood has one, uh, the ACLU has one. <laughs> Yeah, that was not for election, it's for lobbying, but so well uh, information that uh, Representative Hack and Phillips uh, can put together as part of the requirements, and that would be more like a broad brush. If they meet these requirements, then uh, we stand a better chance of getting a waiver. But I mean, we could make this very complicated. Uh, but let's make it a good bill. And now, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, let's let's first recognize that the bill. Forget about the amendment that I just uh, provided. Has nothing to do with these 501c, the six of them. All it does. The reason they're bolded is because they're crossed out of two other sections and put into two other sections. So the, the, the sponsor of the bill wasn't adding additional 501Cs or whatever. It was just a, a, a replacement of the language within the statute. So in my 11 years on Ways and Means, we've never tackled this question of, are these the appropriate uh, codes to be using? And, and, and charitable gaming's only been around a decade and a half. So, and probably bingo longer, but uh, so I think it's a major task for us to take on at this point in time uh, to, to look at all these codes. So uh, uh, in fairness, I, I think either we then retain the bill, if we really want to study these codes to see you know, where I would start with to say, okay, which of the current charities are fall into which of the, I'm, I'm curious about that, which ones are 501C3s uh, and which ones are 50C10s. And, and we may flush something out there that no, no 50310 actually uses this, uh, uh, or is, is, a, is, is, is a current user. So this is a big question. This is beyond this bill uh, to me. It's, it's, uh, Representative uh, Hacken Phillips, I think you're right on beam though. Uh, if more from the perspective that we haven't looked at this in years. Uh, so uh, 
I think uh, my, my opinion is that either we pass it the way it is and then file a bill to, to study this or study it as a committee or just to retain it. If we're willing to all put the work in in the late summer and in, in the fall to really look at all of these codes to see what's in them. So that's, that's just my opinion on that. Uh, I think we're taking on a big bite here uh, to really try to amend all of these codes or add some or delete some uh, within the framework of this bill. Thank you. And I would recommend that uh, if we have, there should be caucuses of, of both parties before next Tuesday. This is one thing to be considered. As far as going into every one of these, you uh, forever to doing that. But if you could come up with, if it's possible, and hopefully Rips and Heck and Phillips come up with something that, what are the things that we're concerned with? Not referring to a 501c, but these are the things we're concerned with, that the money doesn't go to uh, lobbying, doesn't go to these other things without specifically saying a 501 blah, 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 blah. And so we need to make the determination, do we want to pass the bill as it is? Do we want to retain it? Do, do we want to amend it with some guidelines? And so uh, but we, need to do, we need to make up our mind to do something with it. Uh, Representative Ames. Followed by Rep. Actually, yeah, I just want to say that I I, sort of, I I agree with the direction we seem to be going. Um, I, I want to note that there is uh, we're very close to seeing the enactment of uh, either House Bill 565, which I had sponsored, or its equivalent that's come over to us from the Senate as part of an omnibus bill, um, and that bill will be uh, establishing, establishing a committee to study charitable gaming. And certainly this, this uh, sort of this uh, core concern about what is a, a charitable organization should be part of that study. And we could make sure that it is. Uh, I do think it's a complicated endeavor when we get beyond the few sort of general, general words that can be said. I, I think that on this bill, uh, we should take a hard look to see if there's a there's a fix um, that addresses this waiver question um, and um, that doesn't uh, get tangled up with the complexities too much. Um, maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but let's take a hard look at that and maybe we can act on the bill. Um, but. Um, I think there is a larger issue here that's really important and, uh, and that uh, there's another vehicle available to us other than retaining and studying, which has its, uh, has its problems. Um, right. So that's my contribution. Mr. Chair, if I could just chime in real quick, I, I'm cutting, I know. Uh, I actually had the same thought as Representative Ames did about this. That Representative Bromley, yeah. I had a question for Representative Ames. Oh, okay. Uh, Representative Ames, maybe you could work with Representative Hack and Phillips and see if there's some simple rules that we could implement rather than getting into the complexities of 501c3, 4, 5, 19, et cetera. Yeah, we'll talk. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Representative Brown, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry about that, Mr. Chair. I, I, I was just saying that I actually had the same thought about maybe wrapping this into the study committee with the Senate. So uh, that, that, that may have some merits. That's all. Thank you. All right. Before I go to the next one, uh, Representative Ames mentioned House Bill 565, and Representative Bromney had um, Jen do a side by side with one part of Senate Bill 100 to see what was the difference between the two. And has that been distributed to committee members, you know? Yes, it, yes. it should have been, yes. Good. <laughs> we'll give an update on that later, Norm. 
Yuri. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, Representative Hacken Phillips spoke about um, <clears throat> 501c8s and c10s. Those are two of which I I know and and I work with 501c8s. 501c8s, just to give you some idea, would be things like the Knights of Columbus, the Knights of Pythias, the Knights of uh, uh, well, there's a couple other knights that aren't affiliated with anything. Yeah, Odd Fellows, uh, Catholic uh, Foresters, and Foresters Insurance Companies. I believe are all 501c8s, whereas a 501c10 is no, basically uh, carved out for the uh, Masons alone. As far as money is go, going from um, charitable uh, gaming to uh, uh, operation of the entity, I think that's a good idea, and I would be happy to work with Representative Ames and Representative Pack and Phillips on that. Good. Uh, Representative Almey. Thank you. Uh, Representative Brahmi said something about on um, this was just codifying. This language is just codifying what I wasn't sure what, what is already being done without legislation or is uh, maybe found in the bingo code. Uh, where I thought that this was expanding on uh, that we were now just with C3s, but but on uh, can we get clarification from lottery as to whether this language exists somewhere else or whether it's in your rules or or whatever? Thank yeah. you. Can I can I respond to that, Mr. Chair? Go ahead, Representative Brown. Go to page two of the bill, if you have that in front of you. You see I do. Lines, uh, lines four, well, basically uh, four. See, it's crossed out all of the codes there. And if you go down to line 18, the same thing. All they did was they moved, they, they basically did some housekeeping on the statute and put those back in because there's two spots where they got added back in on. Uh, on page one of the bill, on line 15, and page two, uh, uh, line nine, uh, and line eight and nine. So- Thank you, I just noticed that. <laughs> right, so it isn't like they, these were new. These, these, are the, these are the codes we've been using since the beginning of time, is my point. And that's why I said, do we really want to take this on at this moment? Uh, we didn't, it isn't like the bill added other, other uh, uh, 501c codes to deal with or, or, or to agree that to take some away. Uh, if we want to make that into that, then that's going to take some time, is my only concern. And if we had another month, maybe we, we, could, we could do that. But we could take a crack at it and see how we do. But uh, and again, like I said earlier, I agree with Representative Ames that uh, maybe the appropriate place for it would be within that study study committee. Thank you. All right. Any further questions or comments on Senate Bill 27? Then uh, hopefully with uh, Representative Urely, Representative Ames, and Representative Hackman Films working together, we may have a solution. The next bill is House, I mean, Senate Bill 139-FN relative to bingo dates. Let's see if this is going to be a complicated bill. Uh, anybody have any comments, or questions on Senate Bill 139? Well, no. Representative. Romney followed by Representative Almy. The, the, the real question is, uh, I think Senator Senator Avar did this for one one location in his district, uh, and I've had some conversations with some others since the bill was heard, and that not all the not all the bingo halls are 
uh, well, again, they didn't testify, but uh, but not, it's my understanding that not all the bingo, bingo halls agree with this. Uh, th there could be a compromise where we not, you know, because uh, one, remember one question I had asked was, will this force some charities out of, uh, because they basically, um, they, 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 you know, if we, we give more, more dates to some charities, that would mean that other charities would would have less dates, assuming that they're all the dates were taken. Now we heard testimony that in, in this one facility that not all the dates were being taken, but uh, I've I've heard that from um, and I'll, um, what's his name uh, Michael McLaughlin, who we hear from a lot on our committee, that he knows of at least four that have waiting lists for for this. So. Uh, so we're, it seems like this bill is is trying to solve a problem for one one establishment, and potentially could be creating a problem for other establishments that are bingo halls. So that that's uh, I'll let others speak, but uh, that's my only concern right now. And and I, I have to think about maybe amending this, but I don't have a specific thing that would would allow or possibly uh, three or four extra days, uh, a period, uh, if, if someone wants. But I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I'm just concerned that there may be, uh, we may be doing harm to some other charities here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Almy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On um, having listened to both sides of this, I really do not understand why we are still trying to regulate the game dates for bingo. Bingo, as far as I can tell, and we haven't had an update on bingo for quite a long time now, on how, I don't know how many bingo halls are left that are just doing bingo, on um, they, how many, um, Charities are interested in working with them as versus the much more profitable on uh, charitable gaming ones. And um, if we just, as it is, it doesn't read, you have to give 16 day, game dates to one charity. It only reads, you have to give, uh, you can give up to that many, uh, which, but if we just, I don't know if we just excised all of the reference to how many games you can give to whoever, whether the halls could then just figure out how many charities they wanted to divvy it up among. Okay. Any Is there any organization of bingo halls that we could talk to? Uh, John, do you have a response to that? I'm not sure if Mr. Newman also represents some bingo halls. There's some um, um, overlap between uh, bingo and uh, games of chance operators. Um, I think with any more specific questions regarding bingo, I would defer to Valerie King, who's also on the Zoom, um, if you have specific questions about the current state of bingo. Could you bring... Let Valerie in, please. Thank you. Be on our way. Valerie, were you able to uh, listen to the discussion on that? Hi, I just got on. I think you're talking to me. This is Valerie King with New Hampshire Lottery. Yes. And what was the question? The question had to do is uh, a couple parts is how many bingo halls are there left and uh, there's uh, answer that one first. I, there are approximately 15 licensed commercial bingo halls in New Hampshire still some of them um, operate uh, larger uh, venues than others, but there are 15 total that are licensed. 
Can I ask a question? Norma? Could I, could I um, re put in my question again? Yes. Thank you. Um, it, it was, what would it do to the current situation if we just removed all requirements as to how many game dates each charity could get? Well, I, I don't. I don't really have an answer for that. Um, right now, it's 10. Um, we could open it up to more. I don't know that there would be a, a, an effect or not. I, as, you, as you mentioned, Representative Almi, this bill wouldn't prevent the halls from having keeping it to 10 game dates for charities or even less. Um, it, it would just allow that they could go up to 16. Um, as far as the agency is concerned, that wouldn't be a heavy lift for us. We just have to um, increase the number of, of game dates allowed. Um, it would require them to pay for more per month, which could be a financial cost up front. Um, it's only $25 per game date, but if they were to do every day of the month, that could be expensive. But other than that, I do not, I'm not aware of any issues. Any further questions uh, for Valerie, uh, Representative Bromley? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Ms. King. So uh, how many of the charitable gaming locations also offer bingo? I, uh, I, I think it's five or six in my head, but uh, do you have that up? And is that, yes. is that above and beyond the 15 that you mentioned? No, that they're included in the 15. Um, and of those, we have... Lakes Region, which does both Games of Chance and Bingo Lucky 7, uh, Concord Casino, uh, Dover Bowl, Ocean Gaming, Lebanon Poker Room, the Manchester Poker Room, and I believe that's it. So six of them, six of the 15 are also Games of Chance halls. Okay, so they have both licenses? Yes. Okay, thank you. Further questions of Valerie? Seeing none. Any other questions relative to Senate Bill 139? Uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, is if uh, Mike McLaughlin is on the on the on the Zoom, uh, can we bring him in just to offer his comments that he shared you, with me? Would you bring him in? I do not see him. Okay, then that's the answer. <laughs> nope. Yeah, I don't see him either. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, there is an attendee with their hand up. It's the phone number ending in 089. Just allowed them to talk. Okay, 089, uh, would you identify yourself? Is that a star six or star nine? I believe it's star six to unmute. Good morning. Can you hear me now, as they say? Yes. Hello. Yes. Hi, this is Mike McLaughlin. I'm a lobbyist lawyer representing Community Bingo and Arrow International, uh, Senate 139. Uh, I had, had some discussion with Representative Bramey a week ago relative to the impact of the 16 uh, dates. And to our hall, which has a waiting list, the possibility exists that we'd actually eliminate charities as opposed to adding to them. So I had asked uh, the, the thought to put together that maybe uh, an option of three additional dates a month would be work, workable. And that the, uh, some of the Bengals Spartans testified relative to the fact that they went into some odd months and they'd like to have that extra day. We don't see that a 60% increase in the dates is something that actually is uh, going to be benefit, uh, particularly if there's a waiting list, a high, um, performing charity may be able to force others out. So that was the unintended consequence I had mentioned at the hearing uh, several weeks ago. 
And while we recognize there are some charities and there are some halls where there are available dates, I think a little more control over the dates is uh, a good, good thought. Any further questions to ask Mike? Uh, Can I ask? Uh, Representative Bromley. Uh, uh, Mr. McLaughlin, um, so what do you think of Su Representative Almy's suggestion that we just do away with the... Well, I, I think it's an interesting suggestion, but I think that the control factor, if I had a super charity that I could run 30 days a month, why would I want more than one? That carryover coverall would Zoom every night. Uh, I, I think the limitation of dates actually is the protection to the charities. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Alamey. Sorry, on I, I guess he answered why he thinks that doesn't trust the halls to do right by their charities. Thank you. I trust the hall to do right by their owners. Uh, any further questions? All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Any further issues to discuss on Senate Bill 139? Seeing none, then I'm going to close the work session on Senate Bill 139. Uh, the next bill. is Senate Bill 103-FN. Not 101. I'm, I'm sorry, 101-FN. I don't know why I got 103. 101-FN, increasing the minimum gross business income required for filing a business profits tax return. Do we have an amendment offered by Representative Urley and Representative Almy? And before we get into that amendment, there was a question that we asked of the DRA. And the DRA was asked, what would the cost be rather than implementing $75,000 as the trigger, but 85 and 100,000. And I believe we've all received a copy of this. Uh, so before we get into right, Representative Alamy to go over the amendment and, and Representative Yearly, I'm going to have to drop off because I've got to go see a surgeon and, and Representative Abrami will take over. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that. No problem, thank you. Good luck, Norm. Yeah. Good luck, Norm, right. So, uh, Representative Almy, uh, well, first off, is the uh, Department of Revenue on, on the call, on the Zoom? Um, yes, I see Carolyn Lear, Devin Roderick has his hand up, so I'll promote him. Uh, yeah, well, you we can promote both of them, but uh, 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 commission, uh, Assistant Commissioner uh, Lear is the one I want to talk to. Okay. Oh, and I'll promote Melissa Rollins as well. And so, uh, can you just quickly explain what you did on the uh, on what you mailed out to all of us? Um, I don't know, Carolyn, if, if you feel someone else is one of your team, you do that better, just let me know. Hi, Representative. Sorry, this is Carolyn. It took a minute for my screen to refresh when I got promoted. I'm going to let Devin give you um, an explanation of what he's done um, since he performed the actual analysis. 
Hello, representatives. Uh, this is Devin Roderick, financial analyst of the Department of Revenue. Um, we took a look at the two additional um, proposed thresholds amounts that we sent to you. And we, um, we, we applied the same analysis for the original Senate Bill 101, which increased the gross business income threshold from 50,000 to 75,000. Uh, we applied that to tax year 2018 information. And we took a look at federal tax information in order to come up with the results that you see there in the chart. Um, the number of taxpayers who filed tax year 2018 returns, as you can see in each, each row of that chart are the same, that's using the same data. So the original analysis for SB 101, moving that threshold to 75,000 had an estimated impact of 1.5 million and affected essentially 660 um, taxpayers during that tax year. If you increase it to 85,000, it would essentially impact 896 taxpayers who had liability during that tax year. Um, and the impact would be 2.1 million. And with 100,000, the impact would be 2.9 million impacting 1,221 taxpayers who had liability. So overall, um, in each instance, you can see that row that said had zero BPT liability. Those are taxpayers that after everything said and done didn't actually owe any money to the department that year. So we wanna make sure we broke out who was actually, and the number of taxpayers that were actually impacted. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thank you, Devin. Uh, does anyone have any questions specifically for Devin on that? Um, Mine fits within that, I think. I wanted to ask them if um, I, I looked at the inflation since 1993 um, to March to March of this year. Um, it comes out to on um, the 50,000 changes to 92.2 thousand. Um, and uh, that is for, for my interpretation of two data sets for Northeast Urban. Um, for the national one, it changes to 91.7 thousand. Um, if um, in, our, in the amendment that Representative Olery fashioned, um, there is uh, he's put the hundred thousand, but it we seem to be some at just about halfway between eighty five and a hundred thousand in terms of inflation since that time. And I was wondering if um, Devin had any thoughts about the way I calculated the northeast urban or well, we could just say it was ninety two thousand if we were going to do inflation. I don't have any questions about that because I haven't I haven't actually looked at that myself, the time frame that you mentioned. Um, I would mention that the bet thresholds are adjusted biannually using, I believe, the data you just mentioned, the Northeast Urban. Um, and that's been in place since 2015, I believe. So um, I'd have to take a look at, you know, I, I trust the information you're saying, Representative Elmi, but I don't really have any questions about that at this time. Thank you. I think it was passed in 2012, but 15 may have been the first time you did that. Okay, thank you, Devin. Um, Representative Rulery, if you could walk us through the amendment, I, you have your hand up as well, so, um, but do you have a question of, of uh, Devin or do you all? No, no, not at all. I, I was just uh, looking at the, uh, um, the figures here and the, What's not accounted for in this is what Susan or Representative Almy had just uh, stated regarding the rate of inflation. And there's also uh, a bit of a concern about the amount of money that is now floating around being spent everywhere that the dollar amount of uh, $3 million at 100,000 is not going to be worth $3 million uh, because of the uh, uh, devaluation of the uh, value of the dollar by $6 trillion being pumped into the economy from different places. 
Uh, let me see. You've all got a copy of the uh, uh, amendment in front of you, correct? Yeah, that was sent out to everybody. Yeah. Uh, so let's just take a look at that. Hang on a second while I pull it up. Um, there it goes. <clears throat> All it does is change the threshold to $100,000 and then uses existing language in other law to put an inflation um, bait, um, rate in. Now, <clears throat> if we want to leave it at 75 or increase it to 85, um, that, that, that's immaterial. Uh, the, the key factor on this is adding, and uh, I think uh, Representative Longley will agree, would be adding a two-year review to uh, take a look at what the inflation value uh, is based upon the Northeast region, Consumers Northeast region uh, digest um, index, excuse me, <clears throat> so that you have that based in law and we don't have to review this every few years. And it gives our, our small businesses, which, you know, a hundred, uh, one plumber may, uh, with an individual shop earning $100,000, if he has to pay taxes on $100,000, he's not particularly earning $100,000. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's a, a reasonable rate of return for one particular license. Now, if it's a shop like uh, the guy that sells all the hats there on radio that you hear all the time, um, shop like that, he's got... Um, a lot more uh, revenue coming in and, and he's not a one-man shop. The idea of this is to uh, make sure that the one-man shop, the, the smaller businesses have a break from having to file unnecessary paperwork. That's it, any questions? Uh, yeah, I do. And then, uh, and then um, Representative Southworth. Uh, so I just wanna make sure that this is identical to the BET language. That's what I asked them to put in and uh, they, you know, I, I, I trust uh, AOLS to um, AL or whatever it is on uh, legislative services to do their. Um, and the other, other other concern is that it's in sync with that the uh, it's on the same year that the, the the index is applied every two years, and that those those two dates are in sync in terms of. I'll I'll check with that. Um, like, thank you on that, uh, Representative Abrami. Well. Um, We'll check and make sure, but I told them to do that when they put it in here. So it may be a, a small change on that. Okay. Uh, thank you. Representative Southworth. Uh, thank you. Uh, mine is a comment. Although I never like to lose revenue, this does seem like a fair amendment. And I do think um, within the near future, we'll be at 100,000 being fair anyway. So I'm, you know, especially with some of Susan's numbers and things, I think we're gonna be there eventually. And I do think it is something that is fair. Thank you. Okay. Representative Ami. Thank you. Um, I, I've got two things now. Um, the first one is, is if we start at 100,000 now on and inflation does increase uh, quite a bit, then that will be exploding I, uh, faster than, than otherwise. I'd rather go with the 92, I know it's a strange number, but um, also I think we can get uh, DRA, Devin or someone to, to tell us if it's the exact same language. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, I put that in the bill that was passing in 2012, basically because it is extremely painful when you have to increase after 10 years or 20 years on, on the floor. It, you lose a lot more revenue all of a sudden and you haven't been used to doing that. So in, in addition, it is much better for the businesses because it's painful for them to get inflated into to a category. Um, year by year waiting for us to change things. So um, my, other, my only other comment was that on, there is a request in the quick guide to change the applicability date 
And I think that ought to be in the amendment. Uh, change to periods uh, for taxable periods ending on or after December 31, 2022, to ensure that the proposed change impacts uh, all taxpayers fairly for the 22 tax year. So I think that we ought to include that in the amendment. Uh, uh, so I, I think that's a good idea then. If, uh, does, does anybody from the DRA just want to comment on that suggestion? Yes, Representative, we'd be happy to, to review the amendment and um, our, our group will take a look at it and get back to you with any comments or questions on the wording of it. And I'll jump in, Devin, because um, I think what you're asking is for us to comment on that uh, requested change. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so this really, the, the change that we requested would really impact a taxpayer that has a short period return, um, meaning uh, a sh uh, tax year that ends before a full 12 months. Um, because of when we're able to create our forms, uh, if a taxpayer had a short return, our forms wouldn't properly reflect the change in, changed threshold um, with the current due date. And so having, um, or I'm sorry, applicability date. So changing the applicability date would ensure that, you know, every possible permutation of tax year um, would be properly reflected on the return a taxpayer would use. Uh, that makes sense to me. Uh, does anybody have any problem with Ms. Lair's uh, suggestion? And if not, uh, Representative Almi, it sounds like you should amend your amendment to include that. Or, and uh, Representative uh, Ullery. Or Representative Ullery. I'm not sure Ullery. who's in charge of this amendment. Oh, okay. <laughs> Representative Ullery, I'm sorry. Uh, it, does, it doesn't make any difference. I put Susan on because she brought it up. And if she wants to take credit, that's fine. I see material. Uh, the, I have a couple questions real quick. Uh, is everyone comfortable with a, one, uh, 100,000? Uh, no, Representative Schamberg. I think 92, as Susan has suggested, is a good starting spot. It gives us room to get to 100,000 in three years. I, I know the I'm chair, done. Uh, real quick, uh, I, I know the chair wasn't comfortable with going the full 100 uh, in my conversation with him. So perhaps the 92 would help be helpful. You, you may want to have, uh, Jordan, you may want to have two amendments, one with the 92 and one with the 100. And then we can just <coughs> see what the votes are. Yeah, and what's the applicable date on that again? It would be this. Uh, Oh, Carolyn? Representative. Yeah, I don't have my quick guide here. I'm, I'm looking for it. I, I can't find it. Would you like me to email it to you, Representative? Would that be easier? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. No, I got it. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, Representative uh, Janijian, and then followed by uh, Representative... Uh, is that Southworth or is that Tom? Schamberg. Okay. Huh? Schamberg. Oh, Schamberg, okay. So- I'll take down my hand. <laughs> oh, okay. Goes on. So Representative uh, Janigian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is just a, a general question for DRA. Um, I just wanted to compare it. Let's, let's say the, the uh, deduction was 100,000 uh, or the, the threshold was 100,000. Um, therefore, a business who grosses less than 100,000 doesn't file um, a return. If a business makes 100,000 or grosses 100,000 and ten dollars, and let's say they they net 30,000, but the business that grossed 100,000 that didn't have to file also net 30,000, does that mean the business that grossed 100,000 doesn't pay any taxes, but the business that grossed 100,000 and ten pays taxes? That's correct. Um, it's really the difference between a filing threshold versus an exemption. So for example, under the interest and dividends tax, the first 2,400 is wholly exempt, whether you make 2,401 in interest or a million in interest, um, the first 2,400 is exempt. But with a threshold, once you trip that threshold, 
everything is taxable back to dollar one. So it almost it almost gives a business. I'm sorry. Follow up. Yes. Um, it almost gives a business an incentive to. I mean, if they're close to try to keep it below that, because it's it almost creates a unfair scenario where. And this is that's why this is just a general question in general. I'm just trying to think if you grossed 101, uh, you know, 101,000, uh, you could be paying, uh, you know, 7.7 percent of let's say a thirty thousand dollar net, but the one that grossed you know, less than a hundred thousand didn't pay anything. But I guess that's, I mean, that that's a, maybe a discussion for a future day. Yeah. Thank you for that. It's good insight. Um, but then that, that would be a major change in philosophy, I guess. That would be, take us a while to work through, I think. So. Right, thank you. Representative Almi. Thank you. Um, this is a problem with thresholds that um, I've been having to deal with since 1999 when we were working on education funding. Um, it's uh, the only alternative to that is a cascading one where you have one, uh, one rule for the people that are between 80 and 85 and another for 85 to 90 and so on all the way up. And uh, that gets more complicated than anyone wants to deal with. But it, it, it does occur throughout legislation in odd ways sometimes. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So uh, to the DRA, uh, Devin, uh, you're going to do the calculation at the 92,000 level. Uh, get that to, to us uh, hopefully sometime this week. Uh, and Jordan, you're going to, uh, I, would, I would just create a, uh, a second amendment, keep your first amendment live at the 100,000, and then create another one with the, at the 92,000. Is that okay? With you well, I actually, we're going to have to modify them both to put the uh, exactly. um, the date in there. Right. Uh, the other question is, could I ask DRA if they could uh, do an analysis uh, on the 92 uh, and 95 just for giggles? That's totally fine. Yes, Representative. Thank you. All right. So any other questions? Okay, with that, we're going to move on then to the next bill, which is Senate Bill 103. Um, hey, is there uh, any discussion on this? Um, the chair doesn't have any comments on this one. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a comment, uh, okay. a question. Okay, uh, all right, Re Representative Ames and Re Representative Spillsbury next after that. Yeah, sorry to break in. Uh, it's just that I, my, my notes indicate that uh, uh, we were expecting uh, an amendment uh, by DRA, that there's some issue, technical issue with this. I, I just have that note. I'm trying to look at my notes here. I don't see that, but uh, Carolyn, can you chime in, please? No, I don't believe that there were any um, technical issues with this one. Um, I think what we had talked about with you was just our understanding of where this legislation is coming from and that it relates more to, um, or is more impactful in states with personal income taxes where businesses actually have to register with the Department of Revenue and orchestrate withholding um, for employees before they send them to the state. And I think here in New Hampshire where there's no income tax and therefore no withholding requirements, there's no real barrier to entry from our perspective. It's really whether or not the, um, the subsequent activity in New Hampshire results in a tax obligation or not. Yeah, I think, I think it was that review and input that we were looking for. So that's fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, Representative Pillsbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, yeah, I, my note also indicated apparently DRA has an amendment, but I didn't know what it was. My question is uh, the phrase upon request by, which comes up uh, two thirds of the way down page two under notification. And uh, in the hearing, I had asked the question and I, I don't think I really understood any clear answer. How is the Secretary of State supposed to discern the presence of this uh, emergency force and take initiative to put out a request? Uh, but, but before we get to the uh, representative, uh, what line on the, uh, page two are you on? Sure, unfortunately I put off- uh, yes, Line 26, I found it. You did. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, under, this is under notification. And so it reads, any out-of-state business that is present in the state or conducts operations in the state to perform disaster-related or emergency-related work during a disaster response period shall provide, upon request by the Secretary of State, a written statement. So it just, uh, it would seem to me that the shoe has to be on the other foot, that the company who's sending in a force has to let Secretary of State, no, they're there. <laughs> Seems very simple, but I just have a feeling this is one that would be very difficult in practice. Can I ask the DRA if they have any any input on this this language? Hi, uh, Representative, this is Carolyn again. I don't have any insight on that language. I think that part in particular relates more to the business licensing aspect than the tax exemption. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Almey. Thank you. I think that this, we've been given this bill as something that if we change it, it's going to mess up everybody in the national agreement. And um, it makes it rather difficult for things like this, where our Secretary of State's corporations office doesn't really do much in the way of noticing or regulating businesses. They just volunteer to be registered. Um, and I don't know if they're getting better about that. There have been some reforms since I last talked to that division, which was very hard to talk to. Uh, but uh, the Secretary of State is the one that keeps the, the uh, form saying that, yes, I'm a corporation. What right. And in that light, wouldn't it be more sensible for the Secretary of State to passively receive a notice of presence, put it in a file until such time as it might be needed? But we're told if we add anything to this bill or delete anything that we're going to make trouble for the entire national decision. Okay, I don't feel strongly, but it strikes me as a wrinkle in practice. Well, that's a good find, actually. But um, I can reach out to the Secretary of State. I'm sure he's not even aware of this. Yeah, but... reach out to the head of the corporate division. Yeah, right. I don't know who that is nowadays, but I can find uh, out. I don't either, but I understand that, yeah. that it's an improvement. I like the idea of soliciting Secretary of State's opinion before we pass this. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. I, I know him quite well, so I'll, I'll reach out to him and then I'll try to have a quick conversation with him and then have him point me to his uh, corporate division person. All right, so uh, any other comments on this, Bill? Yeah, I'd like to just comment. Uh, yes. uh, on that last discussion, um, I think the, um, I, I don't know, but I, th I, I think the, the goal of this legislation is to enable emergency responses to uh, go forward without being encumbered by unnecessary uh, red tape. And um, that, Probably, and I'm just, I'd like to hear actually from the uh, opponents of this bill more than from the Secretary of State. Um, they were trying to develop a envelope within which um, businesses could operate without having uh, in the first instance to clear a hurdle with the Secretary of State. Um, and perhaps this language about notification 
which is triggered only by a request by the Secretary of State, is um, to enable people to go to the Secretary of State and say, hey, this business is in our state uh, and, um, and needs, needs to um, go through a review process because of this or that. In other words, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's sort of enabling a, a complaint, a, a concern to be brought to the attention of the Secretary of State and then to have a procedure that's in place for the Secretary of State to follow uh, that's that's just a, I, I suppose, a guess on my part, trying to make sense of this, because obviously the Secretary of State in the ordinary course wouldn't know about these businesses. Right. Um, right. So I'd like to hear from the sponsors about this. That would be the sponsor is Senator Bradley. Get, get the explanation. The sponsor is Senator Bradley. I, I can reach out to Senator Bradley uh, and see if he can you know, spare some time next week or even tomorrow. Uh, it may be hard to get a hold of him right away, but I'll, I'll try this afternoon, to track him down, and see if he's uh, willing to add, such, such shed some light on this. Okay. Yeah, if I could, we have to remember that this is a model bill that has not been changed. It is meant for the entire country, and. Uh, the, the idea is that you wouldn't have to look up each state's regulations before you went racing in to help. And on that other states, I am quite sure um, that their secretaries of state do more than our corporate division does. What the corporate division does, uh, well, maybe they're doing a bit more now, but, but what they're, they're charged with doing is to accept on uh, requests for um, certification of your business and your title, at, uh, the title of your business. Uh, some of you may have noticed that brouhaha about trapping that just got resolved through a lawsuit where a guy who was a trapper took over the corporate names of of uh, two organizations set up by a woman who was running an anti-trapping group and hadn't thought to register her names. And uh, I've tried to look at that a number of times, trying to figure out how many businesses we've got that are really businesses active in this state. They don't, or at least a couple of years ago, they still had no idea. They'll register something and then they won't do anything with it. Okay. So. So it's really a question of asking the corporate division what it's doing now, but we've got to remember that our Secretary of State's office is different than all the others in the country. That's a good point. So I'll reach out to both um, and we'll go from there. Uh, any other comments, questions? Okay, so hopefully we'll get some information and, and perhaps some t additional testimony next week uh, on this. All right. Uh, the next one is Senate Bill uh, 211, which is the, the Senate version of the charitable gaming bill. Uh, the Senate, as you're all aware, I think that it did pass uh, 620, House Bill 626. Um, it passed on consent last week. Uh, with no changes. So that's, that's already in the works. Um, and the conversation with, with Senator um, um, Gaida, uh, he's, and, and Senator French, who is the prime sponsor of this, of, of, uh, of 112, uh, that uh, he's willing to make 626 the primary bill and has no problem if we were to retain this bill uh, or whatever we decide to do with it. But, uh, but that's, that's already worked out with the Senate. So they're, uh, they're in agreement that 626 moves forward. And if we wanna, if we wanna kill off 112, they're okay with that. So, uh, so I don't know, I think the debate, we've had the debate on this 
it's just, it's a, their bills are identical with one or two little gr grammatical issues that uh, are there uh, that are there that are minor minor. Uh, so, uh, does anybody have any comments or other input they want on 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 this bill? Seeing none. Okay, we'll we'll move forward. And the last bill is Senate Bill Three. Um, so here's what's going to happen tomorrow morning. Uh, and I think we start at 10 tomorrow. Uh, we were able to secure two, 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 uh, one, of the, one of the, one of the, I forget their names now, but uh, one of them is the chair of the tax accountants uh, group. And, and one other is very active uh, tax accountant that uh, will uh, give us a sense of what they think their members uh, or their 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 advice that their members had given to to the various uh, tax tax attorneys in terms of and they, they did a informal poll over the weekend that they're going to share with us. They, did, they said they didn't have time to do anything formal uh, to give us a sense of how much of that uh, seventy five million or, or uh, that was. Uh, collected in business taxes was really due to uh, their advice that they file under current statute and not uh, uh, under SB uh, three uh, changes. So, so that's that's one big thing that we you know that we we've been asking for, and uh, and the DRA is also going to still owes us some information on. Uh, if we do pass this, what is the implication from uh, uh, tax-wise for ne next fiscal year and the year after that, as well as the year that uh, people just filed for, which was uh, tw uh, 20. So um, so that's where we stand. In that. And then we also have an amendment uh, that's coming, and I, I know Representative Spillsbury um, shared with us not the actual amendment, but what the but what what the amendment will actually say. And if you want to, I think the amendment came in. Is it uh, Representative Abrami, the uh, formal amendment came from OLS this morning at eight forty-five. So uh, I, I was only able to uh, forward it a short time before. Him our session this morning. All right. Um, but it looks pretty much exactly me. like your language, I think, that you it, said. It's it. identical, did not change, that's right. Right. Thank you. you got 9.15 this morning. So do we want to spend a few minutes now just talking through that amendment? Um, Representative Spilsbury? Sure. Um, I suppose I could go on at great length, but we've all been hearing the same thing, so I won't recap everything we've heard. Uh, essentially, Congress acted in two stages. When they enacted the CARES Act in March 20, uh, they did provide to have forgiven debt excluded from taxable income because the normal rule under the Internal Revenue Code is that whenever debt is forgiven, it's taxable. It wasn't until uh, their December um, second stage law that they uh, also um, made it clear that uh, expenses can be deducted. So that, as it stands, is the federal situation. <clears throat> By the accounting we've heard, uh, 22 states conform automatically. Another group of states uh, has taken action uh, to conform, and that leaves 11 states that apparently are poised to uh, leave forgiven uh, PPP debt is taxable and New Hampshire, of course, is one of those because we don't automatically conform and because we refer two years back. So 2018 version of the code um, applies. So I just want to point out that uh, whether to act to conform regarding the non-taxation of forgiven PPP 
is one issue and it is distinct from the question whether to also conform to the December legislation allowing further deduction. Uh, that lives outside the Internal Revenue Code. And, and in the same way that they were dealt with separately at two different times by Congress, I don't want us to view them as though they're necessarily entwined. We can have one or the other or neither or both. <laughs> um, so we have 25,000 businesses in New Hampshire who have received PPP loans. And of course, uh, uh, we have in SB3 a proposal both to exclude those from uh, taxable income and also in uh, paragraph two to allow the expenses to be further deducted. So the purpose of the amendment is to uh, reverse paragraph two so that instead of saying no deduction shall be denied, it says no deduction shall be allowed. But with the DRA's uh, help, we've also included no tax attribute <clears throat> shall be adjusted and no basis shall be adjusted for an expense that is otherwise deduct deductible if the payment of the expense results in forgiveness uh, and the income associated with forgiveness is excluded from gross income pursuant to paragraph one, which is to say specifically in the context of the PPP and the following uh, law. So, so that's the proposal. The proposal of this amendment is to take those two issues, treat them separately and reach a different conclusion. So SB3 would then exclude forgiven debt from taxable income, but it would not then allow the deductions which qualified that PPP fund for um, forgiveness to be used against other income. So, so can I just ask a question right there? So yes. what do we do is, so let's say the salaries are normally a business expense that would come off the, the revenue as we work our way down to what the net profit is, correct? That's so, correct. So what we're saying is that uh, with your amendment, we would not allow uh, those, anything that was paid for by PPP cannot be deducted. Is that correct? Whatever the expense is, whether it's that's, salaries or, you know. That's exactly correct. So just, just to clarify, uh, Representative Brani, uh, the, the CARES Act established two different uh, criteria. One is that you had to use the funds for qualified expenses. And you had to use at least 60% of it for payroll. I suspect that in many cases, 100% of it was used for payroll, but that's not material. You would get your loan forgiven if you spend it for qualified expenses, at least 60% of which were payroll. So we know inherently that any expenses that qualified the PPP for forgiveness um, are the same kinds of expenses that could be deducted in, in our PPT tax. Right, so um, then my next question, I know this from hands. Uh, so what does this do to the numbers? Uh, is this something that you've asked the DRA to take a look at as well? I've, I've asked, but I was advised that uh, until it was determined what direction the committee wanted to take, they were going to hold off. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the bulk of the $91 million uh, that was estimated as uh, a reduction of revenue to the state um, would be uh, reversed. Uh, there are some complications. I, I, I'm not entirely sure that in all cases, 100% of the PPP uh, loans have been offset by deductible expenses. And we also had the question of how the uh, BET uh, factors into things. So I, I do, um, I am anxious to see DRA's assessment, but I think it's fair to assume most of the 91 million would be um, uh, retained. Okay, we've got three hands. So, uh, Representative Almy, then Representative Ames, then uh, Representative, Representative Janagian. 
Representative Almey. Thank you. Uh, this, this amendment would hit the businesses that are struggling and not all of the one, the trouble is that not all of the businesses that got PPP were struggling. I bet not half of them were, uh, but uh, struggling badly. But the ones that were, that got the PPP loans to give, um, keep their employees and give, gave them make work and got very little profit during that period that they were closed down and maybe after for a while as they were coming back. They have lost months or a year of, of profits if we do this. On, and well, they have lost a month, months or a year of profits and on our trying to bring their business back up to normal now and would have to pay tax on, 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 on last year on what profit they did get. So it's a question in there about how many of the businesses had enough profit that they would be showing up uh, for BPT in the first place. Um, but for whom the profit that they did, did have enough profit to be taxed, but that profit was not their normal profit and was not what they were using normally for their own maintenance or to grow the business. I don't see any uh, impact of the B on the BPT that they have to pay from whether we do the bill as it is or the amendment. Uh, I think that's, that's just there as a base. And so yes. anybody who was only paying BET isn't going to be affected by any of this anyway. So several comments, uh, that's absolutely correct. SB3 exclusively addresses business profits tax. It's silent on business enterprise tax. And likewise, the amendment um, follows that, that same uh, dichotomy. Um, but uh, basically the approach of SB3 unamended can only benefit a business that earned a profit because we only tax profit. We're not taxing revenue. There are states that have gross receipts taxes. We're not one of them. Um, and so a business that uh, uh, earned no profit isn't vulnerable to being taxed or for unforgiven PPP loans. A business that struggled uh, without generating profit wouldn't be exposed. One that closed permanently wouldn't be exposed. The greatest hardship cases don't benefit from this bill at all. Uh, that's the irony of it. In, in, and I could go on and on. The, the problem is the intended beneficiaries primarily in the CARES Act were the employees. The purpose was uh, to try to enable businesses to keep people employed and give them the money to do it. And uh, of course, there is a, a, a direct benefit to the employer as well. Uh, to retaining those employees and keeping the doors open. And, you know, I don't think anybody, even at the time the CARES Act was enacted, anticipated the pandemic would endure as long as it has. So everybody was sort of viewing it as a short-term opportunity to live to fight another day. But when you, when you consider who the intended beneficiaries are, and then you ask yourself, if SB3 passed unamended, um, who would actually get the benefit? The more profitable a business was, the more they would benefit from SB3. The more damaged a business was by the pandemic controls, the less they'd benefit. Non-New Hampshire businesses would benefit just as much as New Hampshire domicile businesses. Large businesses would benefit more than small businesses. And this could include multinationals and foreign companies that often receive PPP through small US-based subsidiaries or related entities. So, and incidentally, if we were at the point where we were implementing single sales factor, all of that would just be amplified greatly uh, because we'd be relying more heavily on non-New Hampshire company sales within the state. So I, I just think that um, the more we consider this, the bill is uh, 
a very blunt instrument. I, I think, I think that uh, the complaints on, uh, on their surface are appealing. If somebody were actually exposed to being taxed um, incrementally more than they, uh, you know, than the profits the, that they would have earned otherwise, I, I can see how businesses would complain that it's a harm. But I think much of this, I used the term illusion in, in, in one of my questions in the hearing. I, I think that the, the fear and the concern is largely imagined because uh, um, if, if you've completely offset all of your PPP funds with qualified expenses, there is no incremental tax exposure. So I think there are probably other ways. If, if we believe politically that there are small businesses and independent businesses that continue to struggle, there are other ways to assist them more effectively than this. And this probably won't help them. Okay. Could, could I just ask, would you regard on um, applying the, the newer federal requirement that um, they have lost 25% of their revenue during the pandemic um, as an alternative to this amendment. Let's see, I'm, I'm trying to think through how that squares with what this bill um, is trying to do and what the amendment is trying to do. Um, if they lost 25% of their business, are they a profitable business, sufficiently profitable to exceed the threshold and be taxed under the BPT? But they'd be, they'd have lost it for last year and be recovering now. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure how this puts more money in their hands, but I may be uh, not uh, seeing. Can we do it this way? Uh, uh, we're we're going to be discussing this again tomorrow. Uh, so maybe you can think about that, uh, Representative Spilsbury, and maybe sure. you have a chance to react to that. Okay. Glad to. Thank you, uh, Representative Almy. So, uh, Representative Ames. Yeah, I. I... I think the um, exchange that just occurred really addresses my concerns. I, I, uh, I think the multi-year situation that the uh, expenses occurred in the first year and then in the second year, the loans forgiven are the situations that sort of pose the trickiest uh, um, situation to announce to to understand and to assess, but uh, in one year, a, a business, let's say a pretty big restaurant, um, survives by the, by having that loan that pays for the salaries of the staff that uh, that enable the restaurant to continue operating, and they do receive revenue. Um, about equal to the, this, the cost of keeping the business open. Um, and so they come out of that year and they file their return. Uh, let's say they, they even get uh, some, some profit, so they have to file a return. They're above the threshold. Or maybe they don't file a return. Um, and, uh, and then in the second year, in the next year, the loan's forgiven. And under this amendment, now the those expenses that they took in the previous year, as I understand it, maybe I'm misunderstanding it, um, would now no longer be deductible. So they'd have to file an amended return and um, have a tax liability for that previous year. Or am I misunderstanding? Um, and now they go forward and the loan is not, uh, in the in the new tax year, the loan is is not revenue, so that's good, um, and there are no expenses related to the loan, um, so they go forward. Um, and uh, but they they've got to they now they've got a, a tax liability that relates to that first year, that may may be a hardship. 
think you're raising an interesting question, uh, Representative uh, Ames, and I want to think about it further. And I think we need to hear the DRA's uh, assessment of that. But just to be clear, uh, the PPP initially is a loan, so there's no income. Right. And 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 I think you you uh, you may be right that the forgiveness might occur in a different uh, tax year. Um, so now the income is uh, created, but under SB3, as with the uh, CARES Act, it's excluded from taxation. So your question is the timing of the expenses that were deducted. And specifically, we're speaking of those expenses that were identified in the process of qualifying the PPP loan for forgiveness. Did they occur in the same tax year as the forgiveness? I haven't thought about that previously. It's a great question. Needs some thought. Thank you. Um, Carolyn, can you think about that a few minutes? I'm gonna go to Representative Janigian and if you can just weigh in on that last interchange, uh, but Representative uh, Janigian first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess my question is more to make sure I understand the amendment fully. Uh, because I want to, and I want to use an example to make sure that I understand it. And that is if you have, let's say your PPP loan is forgiven um, and that PPP loan represents one half of your, of your gross income now. So it's, it's now one half, but were you saying the amendment that the, um, that the, the, um, there can't be any adjusted basis for expenses. Does that mean none of the expenses? I mean, I would expect half my expenses to be deductible now because half my income was not from PPP. But the way that amendment is worded, it sounds like I can't deduct any of my expenses. Is that true or am I misunderstanding something there? Yeah, um, I, I'm gonna ask the DRA to confirm this, but my understanding of the usage of the term basis has to do with uh, adjustments for capital items and that sort of thing. So uh, no, the, the first clause, no deduction shall be allowed, relates to the deductions of current expense, dot, 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 um, if the payment of the expense results in forgiveness and the income associated with forgiveness is excluded from gross business income. So I, I believe the answer to your question is no, that's not an issue with conflating two things, but I would want the DRA to confirm that I've got that right. I definitely want to be sure. Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, Carolyn, uh, can you weigh in on both of those last uh, conversations? Sure. I'll start with the last question because that's the one that's fresh in my mind. Um, so <clears throat> the, the first clause, no deductions shall be allowed, no tax attribute shall be adjusted and no basis shall be adjusted for an expense that is otherwise deductible. So all three items, deductions, tax attributes, and basis relate to expenses. Um, a deduction is a deduction. A tax attribute is, for example, a net operating loss, which is contributed to through the use of expenses. Um, and basis is, again, a capital contribution that um, is reflected in expenses. So the limitation on deductions, tax attributes, and basis adjustments relates directly to expenses that would be deductible, but will not be deductible because used to qualify for forgiveness. So it's, it's really, it's not, I guess in your example, it's the 50% um, that were, were paid for with PPP and not the 100% of your expenses that will be prohibited. Representative Janagian or uh, Representative Spilsbury. Yes, if I may, thank you, Mr. Chair, if I may follow up. So, so basically you are confirming that 50% that of the expenses in my example would be allowed to be deducted. Correct. Okay, thank you. Yes, and I think that's consistent. You may recall during the hearing, uh, the question or an answer exchange came up where we were talking about to the extent that I think this language 
makes it clear it's only that only those that qualified for the forgiveness. Okay, and then the, the conversation before uh, was a specific question. I can't remember it all myself. Uh, Carolyn. Um, yeah, I think the question before related to whether there was a potential issue with the expenses being incurred in one year and the forgiveness in a second year. And I think this is an area where we'll all be helped by the testimony of the CPAs tomorrow um, because our expectation has been that taxpayers were going to be treating PPP loans as forgiven um, in the same year that the expenses were incurred. And this is primarily due to some guidance that the IRS had previously issued saying that taxpayers should treat PPP loans um, as forgiven um, if they reasonably believed that they would be forgiven um, in the following tax year. But I think taxpayers may have treated it differently, may not have relied on that IRS guidance. And um, so I think the CPA's uh, testimony will be helpful tomorrow. But ultimately, I think you probably have taxpayers doing a lot of different things um, on their returns with these items of income and expense. that help everybody? Okay, thank you. So, Representative Almi. Yeah, in response to that one, I wanted to make sure that uh, they, the CPAs know that we'd like to know whether they've been, the majority of them have been forgiven yet or not. It sounds like the majority haven't been forgiven yet because it was so complicated for the banks to figure out how to send something to the SBA. Uh, and in that case, um, the question is going to be whether um, the forgiven loans are going to be forgiven by August, which is the latest that we can take this money back to 21, or, or whether we'll be dealing with refunds in after August, which would have to go into 22. And then I also wanted to, to say to Representative Zinigian that that the discussion that we just had about whether the 50% is okay or not is in line 17 in the original bill and also in the amendment, gross business income provided by paragraph one, which was the PPP loans. Okay. I agree. I think that very much limits the identity of the specific expenses in question. Okay. So the only other thing I'd like to do here is, uh, Carolyn, um, you were gonna continue to do some math for us. Uh, uh, wh where does that all stand uh, with your team? Sure. Um, so you had asked specifically to, for us to come up with the fiscal impact of Senate Bill 3, presuming that all PPP loans that the federal government had appropriated are ultimately issued. Um, and we have done that analysis and it's roughly 90, the fiscal impact is roughly 99 million. Um, and also based on the data from the SBA, it does in fact look like they will ultimately exhaust that appropriation by the end of the month. Okay, so what you did is you did it to the uh, all all loans went out all the the money that we had to loan uh, or the the feds had to loan New Hampshire businesses did occur. Correct. Right. <clears throat> and you used your same assumptions about uh, like it seems like it's pretty close to one hundred percent of being forgiven. Is that correct? So to date, for those. Um, 
<clears throat> those applications that the SBA has processed, it's very close to 100% being forgiven. Okay. All right. So uh, is there something in uh, writing you can send us to that effect? Sure, we can do that. Okay. Right. So you'll, you'll be joining us tomorrow, correct? On your team? That's that's correct. We'll be on tomorrow. Okay. Uh, Susan? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think that the problem is that a lot of the bank paperwork for forgiveness hasn't gone forward yet, and we don't know what percentage of that is never going to go forward because they figured out they wouldn't be forgiven. But this is a good maximum. <laughs> well, it's, it's the maximum amount that's going to go out so or be, to be forgiven. So, all right. Uh, Representative Southworth. Uh, thank you. I think we should use the maximum. Um, I'm on the board of an agency who used PPP and every month we'd meet and we'd go through the expenses with the bookkeeper and the list from the state. And um, it really wasn't hard to tell, yes, this counts, no, this doesn't. You know, we had a separate line in our budget for all of it. And I just suspect that a lot of businesses did that because they wanted to be forgiven and they wanted to be careful. Right, okay. All right, any more discussion today on this on this bill or the amendment? Okay. I would just add, if we were in debate mode, there are a lot more things that I could say. I could refer back to the discussion about where other states stand, income taxes, sales taxes, the Danish analog, and on and on and on. But I would just like everybody to really consider, even if we let SB3 go through unamended, would it really reach the targeted beneficiaries? And, and I think the closer you look at it, the money would go in all the wrong directions. <laughs> it would be skewed towards those who don't need it and actually generated profits. And they're only being asked to share 7.7% .7 of that with the people of New Hampshire. Okay. Those are good points. Uh, all right, so uh, we'll, we'll, this is to be continued tomorrow. Uh, I'm looking at the calendar here. Uh, Refresh my memory that someone knows. Is it is it May 27th that we have to have everything voted out? I don't have my calendar in front of me. Does anybody have a calendar handy? To, to yeah, that's correct. Pat. So we, we've got basically three weeks. Well, let's call it two and a half weeks, counting next week, uh, to finalize this one. All right. So that's where that one says. I think Norm... I think Representative Major wants to uh, start executing some of the other bills uh, and this will be held to the end. Uh, we'll probably continue to have conversations on this uh, over the next couple of weeks. So before we break uh, for the day, um, uh, any, any other discussion on Senator yeah. uh, Edith Tucker? Well, it it Tucker. seems to me that it's very important that uh, those who really fully understand all the ins and outs be able to come up with several examples uh, of businesses, mythical businesses perhaps, but based on what we know about businesses in New Hampshire and how they had to deal with the pandemic and the differences in some really struggling and some not. So that as we're talking about this with the more general public, they can understand why it is that there is this concern about that if we don't do this, something like this, the money will go to the wrong, not the intended target. And I, I think those words of Representative Spilbury's need some kind of examples so that, you know, we apparently are going to have two or two and a half weeks before this will be voted on. There is time for some examples to be made up to explain the difference. It's pretty theoretical otherwise. <laughs> and there are a lot of people who are very concerned who are in small businesses. Well, maybe we can have, uh, we can ask the, the accountants to maybe give us some examples tomorrow uh, and maybe blinding the company that they are dealing with that they can give us a sense of of how the math would work for some of these, but we can ask we can ask that tomorrow. 
So uh, you could even ask them whether they agree with Representative Spilsbury that from their knowledge, the money is heading towards the wrong group of people. That yeah, not that's the a legitimate intent. question to ask. I think that would be a terrific question. Right, right. Agreed. Well, tomorrow's the right. We have an opportunity. We got two of these, uh, two of these fellows who uh, I, I, I've dealt with one of them in the past. He's pretty, he's very good, so um, very knowledgeable on this whole issue of you know taxes and tax returns for uh, businesses. Uh, Representative Almi. Thank you. I just wanted to say that the accountants that have clients that are in the category of, um, of profiting a lot off of this um, are highly unlikely to think on their clients. <laughs> we might get good cases for who, who really suffers if we don't do this, but I don't think we're going to get a case for, for the ones above it that is anything but a made up uh, that I don't think we'll get them. Uh, we were do, dealing with an issue sort of like the sensitive like this before and the only way we could get some of the accountants to talk was was behind closed doors. Okay. You're probably right, Representative Almy. The, the problem also, <laughs> uh, to take off from uh, Representative Almy's point is that we hear in hearings from those who are effect effectively advocating <laughs> A position, and they often speak in generalizations. Their examples don't get uh, pinned down and uh, backed up with concrete data. So the complaints tend to be, I exhausted all of my money uh, keeping my employees on the job. I struggled all year and I'm still struggling. I closed my business temporarily and I'm trying to regain momentum. But none of those people sound like they have taxable profits to worry about. You're probably right. The guy with 250 employees did. Okay, any other comments or discussion on this? All right, so to be continued tomorrow. Uh, the only other thing I want to mention is that we, it was briefly mentioned earlier. Uh, we, we passed uh, House Bill 565, which was the study committee with the Senate for charitable gaming. Uh, that, that bill uh, passed on consent calendar, uh, but then it, no, I guess they pulled it off. It wasn't on consent because then they, they, they passed it and then they tabled it. Uh, now they have their version, which is in one of the omnibus bills, it's Senate bill 100 part four is the language of the bill is identical with the exception of, of, uh, Couple of things. They, it, basically, the makeup of the of the uh, uh, the committee. Both say two senators and three three uh, representatives, but the Senate is specific as to where they come from, uh, which committees they come from. So uh, we we have to cover the hearing next Tuesday. It's at nine o'clock, so not all of us. That they we got a request from uh, I think it's in legend. Uh, um, Legislative Administration Committee. <clears throat> so I did talk to Representative Ames this morning, who's who's uh, sponsored Senate Bill. I mean, uh, House Bill uh, 565. And since then, uh, Representative, I did talk to Representative Guida. I did get a, I did track him down this morning. Uh, he's he doesn't have a feeling either way on this as to what, what language we should modify. Uh, but uh, he suggested that I talk to Senator D'Alessandro, which I will, I will do, uh, see how quick I can track him down. Uh, so, uh, and then I'll brief, if I get him today, I'll, I'll brief everybody tomorrow uh, about this again. Uh, you know, and it's the Senate, I think Representative Ames's concern is that he prefer to see this as a House bill, uh, and that um, the, the odds are, if it's a House bill, that the chair will probably be from the House, uh, and that 
uh, we'd, we'd better, we'd probably be more comprehensive uh, being, being this committee being run by us. So, um, so, but anyway, I, I'll, I'll be talking to the uh, Senator D'Alessandro, who's the prime sponsor of the Senate version, um, just to, to see how much flexibility is. Uh, the reason I want to do this now, well, first we have to testify on, I mean, the, the testimony is yes, we, we, we already passed this. Uh, and do we, want to, do we want to offer an amendment to modify the, the makeup of, of the committee? Uh, and, and again, they're very specific. My, my thought was that the, you know, what the compromise should be, the Senate picks the people they want and the House should pick the people we want. So in terms of which committees they come from. So, um, and I think, I think Senator D'Alessandro will agree to that. And uh, <clears throat> so, so that's just an update on that one. Uh, and if, I, if I could. Yes. I sat in on that hearing uh, and Senator, they tabled it because on Senator D'Alessandro really wanted to have someone from finance and someone from ways and means on uh, both, on, on, on both sides, uh, Senate and House. Right. And yeah. I don't know why he, he really needed someone from finance as well as ways and means, but yeah, that was that, that was his main ask. And that's why they tabled it. And I think that if we leave it as a as a house bill and and get it out of of the Senate bill so that it would they would have to take it off the table, which is what they're planning on doing if we do that. Uh, then um, I think he'd probably put in an amendment to put that into that bill on the floor. Which, I mean, that's fine with us, right? I mean, if the Senate wants to have one from uh, finance and one from uh, from ways and means, fine. But I, we have to decide what we want. Our bill is silent. Six, 565 is silent on what what committees the, the members come from, other than the speaker appoints. It's just the speaker appoints three members of the House. Uh, uh, do, are we all in agreement that that the three members should come from Ways and Means? Mm. Or do we want somebody from finance? I don't know what, uh, they don't deal with these things. I mean, it's Ways and Means that deals with this. Seems to me we I think we really need Representative Ames on this. And usually there are two Republicans. So, <laughs> so we'd need, we'd want, so want to do. Two, two Republicans, one Democrat. Yeah, I would chime in, to, just to chime in here. I, you know, I think either way it works out. Um, we just want to get the bill passed. And um, they, um, if the, the Senate version faces uncertainty because of, here in the House, not just because of any tweaks we would like to make to the part of it that's, that's uh, the bill we're talking about, but um, because it's part of a big omnibus bill, and I have no idea. I haven't looked closely at that bill, but uh, but may, omnibus bills have not fared that well. At least some of them, um, either because uh, they ran aground in the House or the Senate, but also because uh, the the governor has uh, has uh, responded negatively to some in the past last year to omnibus bills that had some provision in them that killed the whole thing. So there's, there's risk um, associated with being part of an omnibus bill. And if we're satisfied that there's no risk there, then, then there really is no difference between the two situations. Um, we do have a bill that's made it through the House and the Senate and has been tabled on the Senate side. And so it's in, in a great place to go forward. And the other thing I'd say is that uh, I was there at the Senate hearing too, and I didn't hear such a strong uh, uh, point of view from, from Senator D'Alessandro. I really don't know whether uh, he um, 
if put to the test, would uh, care that much about this. Maybe, maybe he does. I don't know. Well, I'll take his pulse this afternoon if I get him. Uh, you know. Yeah. You know. Yeah. All right. Well, to be continued then. So, uh, all right. Any other business? So I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think we start at ten o'clock tomorrow. Uh, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Very good. So, well, have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bobby, before you leave, did he leave? Um, I have a conflict tomorrow with labor. Uh, for the, I've got a 1045 work session, and then I've got bills to exec tomorrow afternoon or hearing to do tomorrow afternoon. Um, can I pop into you and pop out and then come back in so sure. that I can, uh, so I can take care of the labor need over there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. you know, so you, you could be there the first 45 minutes, correct? It, there at 1045 is the, is the, um, when we meet with the department for, I believe it's Department of Employment Security or somebody for a work session. Yeah, um, we make most of the comments from the accountants, which you'd want to hear. Okay, but and I can, I can follow up with somebody if, for, if I miss anything, um, uh, how, how far however much I miss. Uh, and then I've got to be back over there in the afternoon for a hearing session, so. Okay. All right, all right, That's just wanted you to know that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Right. Bye, everybody. Patrick? Yes, well. Do you know anything about the order of what's going to be done after the accountants? Because I've got a meeting that I really ought to go to that starts at 11 and goes to 11.45. I'm not sure what, I, I, other than the accountants, that's the only thing that Norm mentioned to me in terms of uh, outside guests and possibly some more conversation with the DRA. I don't think we have anybody else lined up um, uh, for tomorrow, so. Okay, I hate to miss any of it, but yeah. okay. I'm, I'm trying to figure out which things. <laughs> All right. Well, you can watch the recording, not the same, but. Jenny, are we recording these? Yes, I was trying to say that oh. earlier. But... Okay, yeah, so we're recording the work sessions as well as the hearings. Oh. Yep. All right, very good, everybody. I just want to know why Edith is uh, stealing signs and putting them up behind her. They, that's a fundraiser. It's a charitable donation when you uh, buy them. Yeah. Is that a 501c3 or something? <laughs> 501c3. And I was treasurer of it for a while and did file annual reports with uh, the secretary of the charitable division. Oh, that works.